Thank you for watching Friendship Community Church Sermons on Demand. We're pleased you have decided to view our pulpit messages. Our Sermons on Demand are a ministry of Friendship Community Church and are provided as a resource to anyone who desires to study the Word of God. So open your Bible and get ready to dig into the Word of God and see what God has for you today. We continue again this morning in our study of 1 Timothy. For, for our guests, that's a book in the New Testament. You've already missed the introduction and all of that. We're, we're halfway through, but we're still in chapter 1. I had originally, when I, when I laid out the text and I studied it initially, I thought I could do 1 Timothy in 12 sermons, but I think I'm not going to make that. No, it won't be that many, but I had thoughts of moving a little faster through the book, but when I prepare each week, I never get very far, and uh, I have, I, as I prepare, I know how many pages I need to, to stop at in order to not go all day, and uh, it seems like I get to that point much quicker than... Uh, than I think I ought to, but there's just so much in the text to go over that I have a hard time uh, getting stopped. We saw in our first 11 verses of chapter 1 that Paul was dealing with false teachers again. It seems like everywhere he went, he was dealing with false teachers. This time he's dealing with false teachers in the church in Ephesus. He's writing to young Pastor Timothy, who he left in Ephesus, and he's dealing with those false teachers. They were perverting the Old Testament along with the Jewish mysticism and along with the influence of some paganism. The Greek people who were involved in Greek mythology were being taught some Jewish mysticism that ultimately would lead to what we call, what we refer to today as Gnosticism. They were perverting teachings of the Old Testament, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, and Paul needed to put an end to it, and he needed to encourage Timothy and teach Timothy about what he needed to, uh, to look at. We ended the message last week by taking a look at verse 11, which speaks specifically of the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, which was what Paul had taught to the people. Remember, gospel doesn't always mean just the story of Jesus on, the, on the, uh, the cross. The gospel is not specifically referring to the first four books of the New Testament. It is a word that is used to refer to the body of doctrine that had been taught. It is, it's a word that, that is used to describe the teachings that the apostles had given the early church. And so when, when Paul says he's talking specifically of the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, he's talking about that, that basic doctrine that he had taught to them that had to be codified in New Testament books. It was, it's with that thought that Paul begins the next paragraph. I'm trying to go paragraph by paragraph in, uh, in the text, and we're only going to take a look at one paragraph in the text this morning but there's a lot in it. So he begins this next paragraph in verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. In verse 11, Paul reminded his readers that he was entrusted with the gospel message. And here in verse 12, he's thankful for being judged as faithful and appointed to his service, appointed to the service of God. It was a privilege for Paul to serve the Lord. It wasn't just a job. It was a privilege. It wasn't just a chore. It was something he got to do, not something he had to do. Notice what he says here about that service. He thanks God for the strength to be counted faithful, to be appointed to service. I thank him who has given me strength. 
Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful. He's thanking God for giving him the strength to serve God. God gave him the strength to do the job God had given him to do. What a testimony that is. Paul could have taken credit for being faithful. He could have said, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a really dedicated guy and I'm really faithful to God. I thank him who has given me strength because he judged me faithful. He's thanking God for giving him the ability to be faithful to God. A tremendous testimony. When he was an apprentice to Gamaliel, I suspect he did his job faithfully. I suspect he was the first one up in the morning studying. And he was the last one studying at night. And that when Gamaliel needed something done... He said to Saul, and Saul went and did it. He was faithful. I suspect he did his job faithfully without grumbling. He didn't take credit for himself. He thanked God for giving him the strength to serve God. That's a remarkable statement. He recognized it was the work of God in his life that gave him the ability to receive the word of God and then to teach. All the while going through difficult times. All the while sitting on the street corner making tents or doing other things to earn income to support his his, uh, group of, of leaders. All the while struggling with the abuse and the attacks that come. He praised God for giving him the strength to serve God. God doesn't give just the Apostle Paul the strength to serve him. He gives it to all of us. We simply have to make use of it. We simply have to tap into that resource. He gives us the strength through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have all been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and through him, we have all the strength we'll ever need. You don't need to ask God for strength. He's given it to you. You just got to tap into it. You just got to throw the switch from self to God. He's the true energizer bunny of strength. It's up to us to utilize the strength just as the Apostle Paul did. I want to make sure that we understand this principle, though. Jump over in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul is again writing to a New Testament church. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's God that does the work through us. Through the strength that he gives us, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. His will is accomplished for his pleasure. We are the tools used by God to accomplish his will, which brings him pleasure. God's pleasure comes from us being compliant to his will, doing what he wants us to do. Paul was judged by God as faithful in complying with his will and accomplishing the directives of God. It's my prayer that you, that I, that all of us will be judged as faithful in accomplishing the directive of God. I want to feel God's pleasure in service of God, just as Eric Little did of Chariots of Fire fame when he ran. When he was asked why he ran, he said, I feel God's pleasure when I run. God was pleased in him. Here Paul's telling the Philippians, for it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I want God to feel his pleasure in us when we serve him every day, all day, in everything that we do. Now back to 1 Timothy. Remember what he said in verse verse 12. He thanked God for the strength to serve God. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and an insolent opponent. 
but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Paul wasn't always a Christian following the direction of God. But he was always one who thought he was doing what God told him to do. Remember Paul's bio. He was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the leading scholars of the day. He rose in the ranks of Jewish leadership to be a Pharisee, and I think maybe even a member of the Sanhedrin. He was empowered by the high priest to arrest Christians for blasphemy because they were teaching something that appeared to be contrary to what God had said. He was a keeper of the law, and he mandated that everyone around him kept the law as well. He fought against the early church by arresting, persecuting, and even killing Christians. He did that because he thought they were violating the word of God. It wasn't until he met face to face with the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus that he understood they weren't blaspheming. They were keeping the word of God. That's when his mission changed to one of following God for the right reason. This reality tells me just a couple of things. The fact that Paul was so so focused on serving God as a Pharisee, and then when he came to know Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, that he recognized the error of his ways. That tells me we can do a couple of things wrong. You may work hard in church, serving God with everything that you have, but do it for the wrong reason, and it is blasphemy. Paul was doing everything he could to end the blasphemy of the church for all the wrong reasons. And I was a blasphemer. He was persecuting the church, and I was a blasphemer. Only work done in the power and strength given to you by God is sufficient to feel God's pleasure. Back to verse 11. I'm sorry, verse 12. That God gave him the strength to serve him for his pleasure. We also see that it appears like it is the service of God and not the service of men that gives God pleasure. Paul thought he was serving God as a Pharisee. He was taking all the Old Testament doctrine and he was hammering that home. And he concluded, though, in that time he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. Paul thought he was serving God by persecuting the early church. But in reality, it was the service of Satan, drawing people away from a relationship with God. Even though he was working through the prevailing religious system, one that was built on the word of God, although they had perverted it, it was counter to serving God, which means it was serving in the interest of Satan. I'm going to make a bold statement now. If there were more people listening, would get in trouble. more than they are serving God. Even in this very city, there are more churches serving Satan than there are serving God. Churches that fail to teach the authority of the word of God. Churches that fail to hold its members accountable to live what they've been taught. Churches that are more concerned with programs that put butts in seats and bucks in plates are serving Satan and not God. Just as the apostle Paul was serving Satan in persecuting the church, thinking he was doing it in service of God. 
I was watching a video from Dr. John MacArthur this week. He was speaking on the work of the church in society. He was speaking of what the church is supposed to be doing in our society. And he said that the only job the preacher had, has is to preach the word of God. The only job God gave the preacher in a church is to preach the word of God. It's not to be the CEO of large ministries or to manage programs. It is to preach the word of God. By this he means that the focus of the church is the deliverance of the word of God to the people of God. It is the responsibility of the preacher to tell you, the, the people in the church what God says and then to lead the congregation in obeying that. That's the mission of the pastor of a church. The primary function of the church is the teaching of the word of God. The primary function of the preacher is the preaching of the word of God. It's building up the church through the ministry of what God says in his word. All that other stuff is stuff that is designed to promote to that the teaching of the word of God. And anything that keeps us from the preaching of the word of God detracts us and is a work of Satan. Now those are hard words. And there would be a lot of, of churches that, and preachers that would be offended at that. But it is what I think Paul is saying. He was serving God with every fiber of his being. He was arresting people he thought were in violation of the word of God. And he himself says that that was blasphemy. I don't think it's any different today. It doesn't matter what your intent is. It matters what you do. But there's hope for those churches who are serving Satan rather than God. Look at verse 13 again. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, blasphemer, a persecutor and an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. God gave Paul mercy because he acted ignorantly in an unbelief. Paul's not trying to say, look, I'm innocent of doing anything wrong. He had just confessed to being a blasphemer. He's not saying I didn't do anything wrong. He's saying that God gave me mercy because I was following a system that seemed like it was following God. Paul thought he was doing the will of God. He thought he was following the direction of the word of God. The problem is he didn't know what the will of God was. He, his, his training, his background, his whole life was all about keeping the law. And that's not what God said. God didn't say, I want you to keep the law. I want you to do this sacrifice. I, don't, I want that to be the focus. God said, I want to have a relationship with you. These are the guidelines. They had so perverted that. It was wrong the way he lived. But it wasn't until he met face to face with the risen Jesus that he came to the reality and the understanding that Jesus is God and it's not blasphemy to worship him. It was blasphemy to keep people from worshiping him. I think that's a situation in many churches today. They've been trained by schools and by systems that focus on the wrong thing. I've been doing a lot of reading lately on church growth again. And they all focus on one thing. The health of the church is determined by how many butts you have in the seat. I admitted to the elders this morning, I've been in a funk all week because of this. People are tra being trained not on the word of God, but on how to manage programs. And how to fill the place up, rather than how to teach the Word of God. I spent a little time this week looking at the, the standard curriculum in seminaries all across the country for pastoral training. It used to be there was a heavy emphasis in Greek and in Hebrew. Hebrew. 
There was a heavy emphasis in, in hermeneutics and exegesis and homiletics and all that study and uh, an emphasis on theology. My master's degree is in theology, not in program management. Lots of seminaries now have master's degrees in management. How do you manage the big program, the big enterprise that you're going to call the church, rather than in studying the Word of God? People have been trained by schools and systems to focus on the wrong thing. Paul was focusing on the wrong thing. I'm not throwing every large church or large ministry or growing church into the same pile. I'm not saying that. There are many churches that are growing exponentially while still teaching the Word of God. But there are many that are not teaching the Word of God. And it's those churches that I think are serving Satan more than they are serving God. They're drawing people in by the droves. They're filling entire basketball arenas in Houston. Or they're asking for people to give $300 so he can buy a new G6. You see that this week? Not my favorite villain, but a, a regular televangelist is looking for enough people to donate $300 each so that he can buy a $65 million plane for his family's protection because they had a failure on the previous plane, which I think is a G5. $65 million, he's, he's got a special campaign. Let's raise that money so me and my family can be safe as we flit all over the, all, all over the world. Those churches can obtain mercy from God, but it'll require a face-to-face -face meeting with God. It'll require a face-to-face -face meeting on the road to Damascus where they come down and they go, look, God, I'm guilty of blasphemy. I didn't recognize, I didn't realize, I didn't know what I was doing. And God will give them mercy because they acted in unbelief. They will need to come to recognize what the true mission of the church is. The true mission of the church is not attendance figures. It is how do you study the word of God? How do you learn what God has said? They need to recognize what the true mission of the church is. Serving God. Teaching His Word. Being obedient to it. And feeling God's pleasure. And that doesn't come when God makes you happy. Now let me spend just a little bit of time on the word unbelief. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. The word unbelief is the word apistia. Ah, pistia, two different words. Ah meaning the negative, pistia being the word that is often used for faith. An unwillingness to commit oneself to another or respond positively to the words, to another's words or actions. Lack of belief or unbelief is how we would translate that. But I want to focus on, on this aspect of it. The unwillingness to commit oneself to another or respond positively to the other's words or actions. It wasn't that Paul didn't believe in God. He was unwilling to commit to the new understanding of God. He was stuck on, Hero Israel, our God, He is one. And he rejected the idea of God walking around with them called Jesus. He was rejecting what was obviously in his face. He had seen the resurrected Jesus. And that's when he came to the understanding. That's when he came to the acceptance. But he knew who Jesus was long before that. If my belief is correct that he was on the Sanhedrin, I think he was part of the ruling body that judged Jesus on the cross. And he had rejected what Jesus had taught. Until that fateful day when on the road to Damascus he's surrounded by light and there falls on his face before the resurrected Jesus. 
Lord, what do you want me to do? I want you to stop hurting me. I want you to stop hurting my church. That's when he came to his senses. And he was at a point where he could believe. God gave him mercy because he acted, he sinned, but his sin was based on bad teaching. It mitigated it some, didn't erase it, because he still said, I was a blasphemer. He still said he was guilty of, of crimes against God. There is hope for those that don't preach the word of God. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He received mercy from God. And as a result, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith, faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. As a result of the mercy of God given to the apostle, the grace of our Lord overflowed him, giving him faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. What you should notice in that verse is Paul didn't earn any of it. The grace of our Lord overflowed for me, which provided him the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. He didn't earn it. He didn't develop it. He didn't bring it to the table. Jesus did. Paul didn't receive his salvation as a reward for good works. How many churches do you know like that? You need to get right with God. You need to stop all this behavior and then come to God. Churches that have dress codes that say, you can't come in looking like that. You can't act like that before people ever come to know Christ. Salvation is not a reward for your action. It is given by God's grace that overflows you with faith. It is given by God to us. It was through the mercy of God on Paul that God's grace was made effective in giving him faith. As Paul laid on his face on the, in the dirt on the road to Damascus, saying, what do you want me to do, Lord? That God's grace overflowed him and gave him faith. Paul thought he was doing what God wanted him to do until he came to face to face with the resurrected Jesus. When we're confronted face to face with Jesus on the road to Damascus, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Paul received mercy from God giving him grace, which resulted in him having faith. God has mercy on us, Gives us grace, which results in us receiving faith to trust God. Don't ever count yourself as noble because you're a Christian. It's not your fault. It's God's fault. And it's only God's fault. It can never be your fault. You did nothing to earn it. Even the faith that you have is given to you from God. You're saved because God and not because of you. You're not saved because you walked an aisle. You're not saved because you said a prayer. You're not saved because you signed a card. You are saved because of the faith that God gave you from the overflowing of His grace, because He had mercy on you. What was your fault is you should die, because you sinned. You should have been DRT. And God said, I'm going to give you mercy. I love the way Paul phrases this. How the grace of God overflowed him. Overflowed is a word that's used only here in the New Testament. You can find it no other place in the New Testament. It's a word that is used in commercial applications. That means to fill something up to the point that it overflows. Most lexicons add that it figuratively means great abundance or extraordinary, extraordinary abundance. God gives us so much grace that it's more than we need. 
It overflows. Your repository for grace is full and overflowing. More than is necessary to save you. God overflowed us with his grace. Despite the fact that Paul was doing what he thought God wanted, despite the fact that he thought he was serving God, it was necessary for God to overflow him with grace based upon his mercy. So God applied mercy to Paul, overflowing him with grace, giving him faith to believe in God. I don't know how I could explain it any better than the way the, Paul, the Apostle Paul has said. He didn't do it. The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Paul looked at himself as the <clears throat> worst sinner saved by grace. Notice again in this verse that it's Jesus that does the saving and not the person being saved. You are not saved because you did anything. You are saved because Jesus did something. A trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. We'll explain that in a minute. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Not to see sinners saved, but to save them. He's the active one doing the saving, not us. You couldn't save yourself. You would just end up in the lake of fire. Notice also that Paul says it's a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance. That was a technique used in writing back then. Today we would use an underline and bold and a 48-point font and big exclamation parts, uh, points and some emoticons and all of that kind of stuff. We would put emphasis on, on this statement. Paul is saying, look, pay attention to what I'm about to say. This is something that's true and you should accept it with no reservation is what Paul is saying. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. Paul said, look, Jesus came to save sinners, and I'm the worst sinner possible. Remember, he had just confessed to blasphemy. Blasphemy was a very high sin in Jewish culture. He said, I'm this foremost of the sinners, and Jesus Christ to save came to save sinners. It's like Paul was using, to use our vernacular, this is settled science. There's no reason to debate it. Now, when the liberal left says that, it usually means it's not settled science, they just want you to think it is. But Paul is saying, look, this is settled. <clears throat> There's no debate. It's like going to the mathematician and saying, what do two plus two mean? They mean four. That's settled. It can't mean 3.99. It can't mean 4.1. It means 4. It's settled. That's what Paul says here. It is settled. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. The salvation of sinners was not a byproduct of Jesus' time on the earth. It wasn't just something that happened because Jesus was on the earth as though a secondary object. It was the express purpose that he came to earth. It was part of the plan that God had decreed from the very beginning before there was time. From before the foundation of the earth, before God created, it was already decreed that Jesus would come to save sinners. It was the purpose. Everything that God did through Jesus' incarnation was to bring sinners to salvation. The very birth of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and it was all to save sinners. Every part of the, of the miracles that Jesus did, the teaching that Jesus did, was all to bring sinners to Christ. Today, our calendar system turns roughly on that event. <coughs> the early 
calendar makers got the time frame wrong, but roughly our calendars turn from B.C., before Christ, to A.D., Anno Domini, or the year of our Lord, to, to it pivots on the time of Jesus Christ. And in reality, all of God's decree pivots on Jesus Christ. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us. It was the plan for Jesus to come to die on a cross to save us. Even before there was sin. Even before there was the potential for sin. It was the plan. It is the central core of the decree of God. But I receive mercy for this reason. That in me, that in me as the foremost... Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. I love the humility of the Apostle Paul. We read in verse 15 that he considered himself to be the foremost sinner in the world. Even though he thought he was the worst sinner, God chose him and saved him. And Paul says, he did that as an example. If I, being the worst sinner, could be saved by God, you who are not the worst sinner can also be saved by God. What a perfect teaching moment he had. In many ways, Paul was offering himself up as a case study on how God works. He says, God gave him mercy so that others who weren't as bad a sinner as Paul, could see God give eternal life to someone who was worse than them. If God could save Paul, he could save me, is the thing that Paul wanted them to understand. Now, before you get all rabbinic and you jump up and yell that it only takes one sin to send us to hell, so it doesn't matter how bad a sinner you are, Paul is not teaching about soteriology, He's not teaching about the doctrine of salvation or the doctrine of sin. That's not his intent here. He's making an emotional appeal. Look, I'm the worst sinner possible. And if I'm the worst sinner and was saved, you, the less worst sinner, could also be saved. Paul's not teaching soteriology. He's not teaching the doctrine of salvation here. He's teaching emotion to them. He's simply pointing out that from the vantage point of the unbeliever who has no ability to understand soteriology, that if Paul, the worst sinner in history, could be saved, then everyone else could be saved as well. That's the point he's making. From a soteriological position, how bad a sinner a person is has no impact on their savability. There's no impact on it because, as I said, it only takes one sin to send you to hell. But the unsaved person who has no history with the Word of God or theology, the vantage point is, if Paul could be saved, who claims to be the worst, then everyone can be saved. Paul is addressing this statement from their vantage point. He's not contradicting what he would teach later on about soteriology. If he, the worst sinner, could be saved, then so could they. Paul was removing obstacles to their unbelief. He was removing things that would prevent them. And how many of us have seen people or maybe have been in that camp? Well, I've just done so much wrong, there's no way God could save me. Well, if Paul claims to be the worst sinner could be saved, then there's hope for you as well. Paul also told his readers that God had tremendous patience with him. I'm thankful that God has patience. He was forcing others to keep the law, Paul was. Persecuting the church, even killing members of the church. And yet God had patience with him. God didn't punish him right then for what he had done. If God would have patience with him, he'll have patience with us as well. We also see in this verse that adherence to dogma does not save you. 
Paul, as a Pharisee, was doing everything he could to be obedient to the dogma the Pharisees taught. But it didn't save him. He was totally committed to it. He did everything in his life to serve God. And it didn't save him. All it did was make him the worst of sinners. His adherence to the improper dogma of the Pharisees didn't do anything but make him the worst of sinners. <clears throat> Some people teach today that it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you believe it deeply. You could hear that being taught at Lakewood Church in Houston. That we want you to believe in Jesus, but if you really believe in Allah, that's okay too, as long as you're sincere. Well, you can be sincerely wrong. Paul proved it. He was completely dedicated and sincere in his following of what he thought was the will of God. And it made him the worst of sinners. He had to accept, to believe in salvation option presented to him by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. It wasn't the killing of the church that saved him. It was the death of Jesus on the cross that saved him, and God gave him the faith to believe it. He had to have faith given to him by the overflowing of God's grace, which was permitted because of God's mercy. See, God's justice should have executed Paul. God's mercy said, no, let's wait. God's patience said, no, let's wait. And then he came face to face with Jesus Christ on the, on the road to Damascus. It's not how much you believe. It's in what you believe. You can believe in the wrong thing and die. Verse 17. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I love the emotion of the Apostle Paul. In this final sentence of the paragraph, it's almost like he was, he was just finished teaching the Ephesians and young Pastor Timothy that he was the worst sinner, saved by the mercy of God through the overflowing grace that gave him faith. And his emotion turned him away. He couldn't, he couldn't hold back. He had to go in a sort of doxology. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. I love the description. He was the worst of sinners, saved by God's grace. He reminded them that the same could be true for them. Then in this verse, it's like he's overcome by, by the emotion as he burst into praise and worship of God. He calls him the eternal king, the only transcendent being. He not only stands outside of time and space, he made time and space. He is sovereign, not to be taken down by others. He remains in control of the affairs of the world. He then called him immortal beyond the reach of death or decay. Not like mortal kings who die and are replaced. Invisible. Not subject to being seen. He stands in another dimension outside of time and space. Not to be seen by us. I don't think this means that God can't be seen. I think it means that he's not subject to our seeing him. We don't have the capability to see him. We don't have anything within us that would permit us to see him other than through Jesus Christ, the personification of the Godhead in bodily form. He has no appearance. I think it means we don't have the ability to see him, not that he can't be seen. The only trusted God, or the, I'm sorry, the only God, God alone has the claim to authority. In, a, in the universe, and specifically in the church. 
God's word is the authoritative representative of God and speaks what he wants spoken. No one can compare to God. No one can stop God. No one can remove God. He is self-sufficient and without equal. No one is... God depends on no one to accomplish his goals. He uses us, but he doesn't depend on us. Paul breaks into the, this praise and worship of God because of the emotion he feels at his own salvation. I am the worst of sinners given mercy by God. And he breaks into the praise and worship of God. He's overwhelmed by emotion because of the gratitude he feels that, at the blessing of God. So how do we respond to our salvation? When you think about your salvation, how do you respond? Are you overcome by emotion and gratitude for God saving you? Or do you still hold that you are partly responsible and so you're not so emotional about it because after all you did it yourself? Do you worship God when you think about how he's blessed you? Is it an emotional thing to you that God saved you? And that someday you're not going to be a crispy critter in hell? We've all probably been burned, right? It hurts. Right now I'd like to say it hurts like hell, but it, hell hurts a lot more. And it'll be forever. If you don't get emotional about your experience with God, with your salvation... Then I have to question, is your salvation real to you? You may not think of yourself as the worst of sinners like Paul, but just how do we respond to the fact that God overflowed us with grace and gave us faith to believe him? You could never have saved yourself. You could never have done enough to even approach heaven, let alone Get to heaven. God had mercy on you, gave you grace, which provided you faith to trust him. For that we should be worshiping God all the time with everything we have. We should be in a constant state of emotion with God, with worship of God. We should be giving God honor and glory all the time. That should be our primary focus in our world. Our life should reflect who God is and what he has called us to do. There should never be a time that we are prevented or from worshiping God. The problem is often that something keeps us from worshiping God or giving him the glory. We should worship him in the morning, during the day, and into the night all the time. It should be part of the way of our life. It should be an emotional response every time you think of the salvation you have in Christ Jesus. God had mercy on you and gave you faith to trust him. He gave you the faith to trust him. You didn't have the faith. You didn't exercise enough faith. God gave you the faith to believe him. For that he deserves our allegiance and our worship. No one, no one, or no thing deserves your allegiance or a worship other than God. God alone stands as the one we should follow. God alone is the one we're dedicated to. Not R's and D's, Republicans and Democrats. Not leaders. Not anything other than God. That's the only one. Nothing deserves our worship. Nothing deserves our allegiance like God does. Because nothing provided for you eternal life other than God. Father, thank you for the emotion of the Apostle Paul who breaks out into, into worship when he thinks about the salvation provided to us, to him. The worst of sinners, he says. But we recognize we're all sinners.
all sinners deserving of an eternity in hell. But you have given us mercy. You've overflowed us with grace. You've provided through that grace faith to trust you. You've indwelt us with your Holy Spirit to give us power and strength so that we might be found faithful. That gives you pleasure. Lord, I want to sense your pleasure in what we do here at Friendship Community Church. I want to know that we are teaching your word and that's what you've called us to do. We love you, Father. We're dedicated to serving you. Show us how to use the strength that you give us to do it. In a difficult world that seems like it's getting more difficult every day. Society is becoming less and less focused on you and more and more focused on themselves or focused on some other false religion. Remind us that it's a relationship with you that you desire for us. It's not a dedication to some practice, but a dedication to you. Only you are worthy of our worship. We worship you and honor you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching this Sermon on Demand at Friendship Community Church. If this message has been helpful to you in your understanding of the Word of God, please let folks at Friendship Community Church know by sending an email to watching at friendshipcomchurch.org. Thank you again for watching, and we look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Community Church.